So good morning, uh, everybody. Thank, thanks for showing up. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Zvonimir Bandik, and um, uh, I work in Western Digital Corporation, CTO office, uh, and have been part of the RIS-5 journey since the early days when I had uh, uh, P. Feng Cheng from Professor Bor Nikolic's group uh, at Berkeley come to AGST Research, uh, which is our legacy in Western Digital now, and she brought the first uh, RISC-V uh, CPU and FPGA. We've been struggling in AGST to get any IP, and our ASIC team wouldn't really share uh, ARM cores or anything else that they had, so this was a, sort of a big step for us, and we never really, you know, we never really went back. So today I'll be speaking about our RISC-V EHX3 CPU for storage acceleration, and um, the the, let me see if I can, aha, uh -huh, good, I can catch screen here. So the, the agenda is I'll, I'll go and explain our ecosystem engagement, uh, and then I'll give a roadmap overview for Swerve cores, and then I'll introduce the uh, Swerve EHX3 CPU IP, and uh, show some details of the architecture, performance, and then uh, leave time for questions. All right, so on the ecosystem engagement, so, Probably many of you know we have open sourced some pretty awesome cores. Uh, these are uh, EHX1 and dual threaded version EHX2, as well as the small core ELX2. And th this has been awesome. This, um, uh, this uh, seeded the ecosystem with high quality IP that had been fully verified following best industry practices. And in our accounting, um, both uh, through Chips Alliance GitHub and through the partnership with Codasip that provided commercial technical support for the cores, we have probably about 10 to 12 companies that have adopted and taped out, taped out um, uh, Swerve cores. Some of them uh, announced, uh, had kind of like a present technical presentations like Imagination Tech, some kept them secret. Some of these companies are super cool and super interesting. So it's a kind of very, very interesting ecosystem out there that has taped out silicon multiple times and already shipped, uh, shipped the IP in products. Um, so this has been really great. It, it, it has raised the, the belief in RISC-5. It, it has demonstrated that, that core can be high quality and why, why wouldn't they? And, and uh, it helped develop a significantly improved software ecosystem because all these companies collaborated on the on the firmware tool chain, dramatically improved the GCC tool chain code density, uh, brought up LLVM functionality for S5, and, and this has really, really, uh, really enabled uh, high quality uh, firmware tool chains, and those are actually provided uh, by Western Digital and GitHub. Uh, so, uh, future Swerve cores may not be open source anymore. Uh, the one that I'll be talking about today is uh, so far proprietary. And we will continue to engage external partners, uh, potential external customers, and kind of keep, uh, keep working together with various licensing models. All right, so here is the, here is the uh, family overview. Um, I've, uh, I've shown this chart uh, before on RISC-5 summits, uh, not with the bottom, uh, uh, bottom two cores. So uh, our first uh, set of uh, cores were Swerve VH1, which was a um, nine stage or maybe a stage if you uh, uh, count more accurately, um, uh, uh, super scalar uh, um, uh, uh, core for embedded applications targeting primarily uh, uh, flash and HDD controllers. The Swerve EHX2 was a dual threaded version and is still the only commercial grade uh, multi-threaded embedded core, meaning that uh, that uh, dual threading is combined with closely coupled memories and, and, and um, very low latency hardware interrupts. And as such, is kind of a unique gem in the, in the overall uh, RISC-V family. Uh, then we have uh, continued developing this roadmap with a, with a SWER VLX2S core, which is, targeting, which is a proprietary core targeting uh, security applications. And uh, this one, uh, uh, this one, we'll probably talk more about uh, more about in the future. Um, and uh, finally, for this presentation, 
uh, I'll be talking about our uh, uh, 248 core capable CPU complex called EHX3. We'll, we'll give you a lot of details you know, about the caches, about uh, uh, the architecture, et cetera. And there's more coming, right? So um, uh, we have a partner with Codasip on the, on the commercial support for open source cores. For those companies who are interested uh, to download GitHub from Chips Alliance, but are maybe scared to do the implementation themselves or need some kind of help, with, uh, we train Codasync team to support this. And they develop one of their line of their businesses based on this. So what are the EHX3 goals, right? So um, the, I kind of don't, li don't like this setup, but um, well, first, uh, first, we wanted, uh, first we wanted to develop a 64-bit 64 64-bit 64 Linux-capable core um, and, um, and allow support of multi-threaded operating systems such as Linux uh, and Android. And we wanted to target very low power implementations. And this really kind of started with uh, storage first, but then kind of storage being an edge device spread to many, many multiple other edge applications. If you, if you have a low power device and th think of a SSD or think, of, think even of your USB thumb drive, if you have this device and you want to add a Linux capability on it, perhaps you want to give device some autonomy to uh, mount a file system or to be able to see the file system, to be able to see the files, to do some useful intelligence, like if you wanted to have an application that will sort your images, right? Uh, use some, some of the well-known neural network inferencing algorithms uh, and kind of uh, uh, suggest a directory structure, group your photos. If you wanted to put such an intelligence on into edge device, you wouldn't want it to spend 10 watts or 15 watts. You would want something small. So this was the target here. You know, we wanted four cores to go into several hundred milliwatts. We wanted to be able to run Linux, but we didn't want to you know, burn too much power. Uh, we wanted to have a SMP support and we wanted to have an awesome performance. So we figured, okay, since we are starting this project from scratch, let's make sure each core has private L1 and private L2 cache to really kind of differentiate, differentiate this marketplace. So we have private L2 caches. And, and, um, and this is really, if you, if you look at the design, this is a third generation of our designs. We have used a lot of uh, components from the um, Apache V2 open source license designs. We had the hardened pipeline. Uh, we did a lot of changes, but we, we kind of had a lot of, um, a lot of confidence in our design given the number of silicon tape outs that we went through. So um, uh, some of the applications that were this core went to were security, data pad controller for storage, uh, GPUs, uh, DSPs, um, and a variety of, um, variety of sort of uh, data path accelerators, variety of devices that sit very close to storage and can do different data services. So we think about probably about dozens of uh, uh, customers or adopters of open source IP. Uh, what are the example applications for Sphere VHX3? If you, will, as I said, if I want to put an Android and Linux uh, on, on some kind of IoT device, the power is a king. And some of these devices run on batteries, so power is a double king. Uh, and, uh, and again, this started with the storage in mind, but storage devices are just some of the edge devices. There's many more. So this kind of can bring power of Android and Linux to the edge. And you know, if you're talking to your ASIC manager, 300 milliwatt or 400 milliwatt is some kind of range where he is still not going to get the heart attack, right? But so. <laughs> The, the, um, the second application is very much related because it's related to storage. Um, uh, a lot of people are uh, experimenting with the DPU devices with uh, uh, Mellanox and Vidya being the leader with Bluefield, but now there is an Intel IPU. There's, there are devices that hyperscalers have built. There's many startups, many interesting startups like, like Speed Data in Israel or, 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 or Fungible that kind of build a device that can accelerate certain operations and sit very close to storage and communicate to storage. So they need a lot of cores. And this is another kind of interesting, uh, interesting application. I think people typically focus on providing networking, storage networking services like NVMe over Fabric, or they provide capacity and performance management, data du duplication, compression, data decryption, re-encryption, management of the keys, all sorts of security schemes. Uh, and, uh, and also PCI Express device virtualization. 
And, and I would say these types of workloads in general is what we in the storage industry call computational storage workloads. But you may, you, you may find them uh, very often under different names like in storage compute or even in memory compute. So let's go to Sver VHX3 architecture. So this is this pipeline, like in, in, in my team, Invest in Digital, we, we, we live and breed cores, right? And, and, and I remember to this day, on the first day when we started, when Robert Gola actually has drawn this diagram. So, so this is the, the, our third generation design, uh, and it's uh, uh, following proper uh, RISC V lingo, and hopefully it didn't change in the last couple of weeks. This should be RV64 GBC core. Uh, as, as we are supporting uh, um, uh, compressed instructions. It's an uh, eight st stage or nine, st uh, nine stage pipeline, depending how you count commit. Uh, the, uh, some of the very important high performance features that really help performance numbers for, for this is a super scalar dual pipeline and the presence of four ALU units. So if you look at the stage five and look at the, uh, again to stage eights, you will see that there is, there is like a, a, dual, um, a dual set of ALUs in both pipelines. So two pipelines, when you are lucky, can give you 25 to 30% boost with some sort of random code. It can even be double, but that's, you don't get it in real life. And with the dual set of ALUs, you have this amazing performance feature that when you miss, if your load cannot load the registers in time to do the logic operation, the pipeline keeps flowing and gets a second chance. The second chance gives an additional, you know, typically 25 to 30% boost compared to the scalar, pip scalar pip pipeline like our e ELX2, right? So, so, so this, this is great for performance. Now we started thinking about Linux and Android. So we have uh, support for L1, iCache, and, and dCache, uh, uh, 32, uh, 32 kilobytes. And for the private L2 unified cache, which is configurable between 128 and 512 uh, kilobytes, in most of our examples uh, today, we will use 256 uh, for L2, which is a sweet spot being eight times larger than L1. Uh, we have a, the, on the new features, uh, in addition to the load store pipe, uh, that's now very different, we have a floating point pipeline, so we support floating point. Uh, and then obviously support for user machine and supervisor mode. Coherency is supported with the tiling protocol, uh, which is something that we did uh, by sort of forward looking to the future because we are standardizing tiling over Ethernet protocol in RISC V and Chips Alliance under the brand name OmniExtend. So the native support for tiling is going to allow um, uh, um, all these different uh, all these different methodologies to expose memory over Ethernet and create create SMP cluster using Ethernet as a fabric. So it's kind of nice to have that done natively. And, oh, sorry, and one more thing. Um, our target frequency is 1.8 gigahertz. Uh, this is looking at seven nanometer typical, typical corner. This is a very conservative number. So, so uh, I would like to expect at least 20, 25% more uh, uh, when this gets uh, on silicon. Um, in terms of the uh, SMP, we support, uh, uh, we, in a configurable way, we can support two, four, or eight cores. Uh, we have a shared L3 cache, again, configurable uh, up to four megabytes. Um, all the cache lines operate at, at 64 bytes, and the L3 cache is 16 ways with two banks and 16 sub-banks focusing on the power management. So, so L3 cache is very, a controller is very power sensitive. Um, and, uh, and uh, in terms of the system level attachments, currently we support attachment to the AXI bus. And I expect that uh, given different partners and customers, the, the, the number of interfaces will grow. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, Linux and Android support, this was probably most commonly asked question, at least for me, first time I presented EHX1 core, I was getting a lot of questions from the audience and when are we going to support the MMU, when are we going to, even our guys in, 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 in the Western Digital CT office, they're more anxious and interested to work on Linux and Android than to, you know, than to worry about embedded systems, right? So, so we have added, obviously, support for M MMU being that now we are targeting uh, Linux and Android. Uh, and we are following uh, the, uh, the standard, standard uh, uh, risk-five uh, scheme for MMU. Nothing, nothing particularly exciting uh, 
except obviously this, this is another big piece of the effort in developing EHX3 and another big piece in design verification. And uh, this is one of our first uh, um, uh, physical designs. This is an example with four EHX3 cores. They are highlight, you know, just to highlight that there is four of them, they're shown in four different colors. Uh, and uh, shared L3 cache, in this case, four megabytes is on the right. Uh, and this is just an example of the eight core uh, EHX3 floor plan. So we've, we've kind of, uh, uh, we kind of stopped at eight. We think eight is, uh, is a uh, sweet spot given the performance and power profile of the core. And it's also a reasonable number, you know, to have a, uh, to have a good uh, design verification schedule. Performance, right. So, um, uh -huh, okay, I'll let me then accelerate a little bit. I, was, I thought it was up until 1130. No, the next talk starts from Monday. Ah, okay. All right, so in terms of performance, we have leveraged our Zeno 3 performance model. Uh, and this has, uh, uh, this has been used in the past and, and validated previous performance numbers with a sort of 2% or better accuracy. And we have a very good correlation between RTL and EH, uh, for the Zeno 3 and EHX2 core. Uh, and, um, and what we have done, we did a lot of measurements on the target cores that we have referenced our, ourselves against. And we did a, a both the Zeno 3 modeling board for the target cores, uh, which was our performance target, and for EHX3. So executive level summary for performance, it's about you know, 11 to 16% uh, above, the, above our, our target. And here are some of the example scores. Uh, this is a single threaded result for one core and showing spec in 2006 comparing to the target. Uh, overall, we are getting, uh, getting about, uh, slightly above uh, six on the 2006. Then uh, there is a spec in 2007 ratio results. So ratio means we are just uh, uh, doing a relative comparison on 2017 to target, getting, getting overall about 16% uh, 16, 16 better. Uh, and don't worry about taking photos. The, these charts are on RISC-5 Summit website, so it's all. The, the only one that's special for you guys in the audience was the eight core floor plan. Every, everything else is in the, <laughs> is in the PowerPoint there. Uh, and uh, on, on, the, on the rate, uh, when you basically run four instances on spec 2006, we get about 10% better performance than the target. Uh, and similarly on spec 2017, we get uh, about 14% better. So that's, that's the overall kind of, so in, in summary, the expected deliverables for EHX3 are RTL IP, the hardened blocks, verification test benches, processor support package, performance optimized tool chain that we are working on, and, and, and many others. And uh, so Swerve EHX3 is in beta now, and if you have any additional questions or want any additional information, you can contact me on uh, zvonimir.bandic at wdc.com or our marketing leader, Ted Marena, at uh, uh, same domain, wdc.com. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, let's give him a round of applause. So I'll remind the online viewers and even the people in the room that are connected to the, the virtual presentation, if your questions go into the chat, that will facilitate asking questions. We do have questions already queued up, though, so you've prompted awesome. a lot of good thinking here. Um, First question, private L1, L2, and a shared L3 seems like an interesting choice. Can you explain the design decision just a little bit more, perhaps maybe some of the trade-offs, how yeah. you came to the conclusion? So or, or, originally we were, we were comparing ourselves to the uh, quad core cluster found in front end of some high-end uh, enterprise flash controllers. That cluster had only private L1 and shared L2 for four cores, one way to beat it in performance is, is bothering to implement a deeper memory hierarchy and add private L2 cores. But this makes implementation non-trivially non more, more difficult. Okay. Go but right. yeah, it, it'll boost performance benchmarks depending what you look by, probably at least uh, 15, 
Excellent. And we have a future looking question. Is there a plan to support vector extensions in future cores and, and keep the low power targets? That, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Yes, we were, we've been thinking and we haven't done the proper design and verification, but we were doing a lot of research and prototyping onto adding uh, vectors on our small core. We have ELX2 uh, single stage pipeline, so that, that's, that's the one that we were thinking about adding vector in crypto. Okay, another performance question. What is the performance target for spec in 2K6, 2006? Does that ring a bell with you? Yes, it's six. It's six uh, uh, as a single, uh, single core. Six for a single core. Yeah, okay. single core, single thread. And then I, I think this goes to the process for adding extensions. As I understand, you're partnering with people that want to take the core and license it. How do you add extra customized extensions to your cores? So, so uh, it depends which cores they are. This was the Swerve core. Yeah. Just says... yeah so, so we had, uh, uh, for our open source cores, we partnered the Codasip. And Codasip actually provided some uh, support with Codal for adding extensions. Um, for more complicated cores where there is no easy uh, software way, it, it, will, it will require some form of collaboration with uh, Western Digital. Okay, excellent. I'll look around the room, see if there's anybody who wants to raise a hand and holler a question, and then I'll repeat it. If not, I'm going to take one more question, and then we'll give you a final round of applause. The question was, uh, in the tile link interconnect, right, where you had the, had the chart architecture, um, is that natively supported by the master cores or is there a bridge? And if there's a bridge, what's the latency through it? Uh, no, there is no bridge. Tilink is uh, natively supported. Tilink is natively supported. That, that, that's the comment that I said during the presentation. It's natively supported by forward looking to the OmniExtend architecture. Okay. Excellent. Oh, I do have one. Okay, you get the last question. Ask it out loud and then I'll repeat it. Question, right. The, the verification test benches, uh, we, we never open source verification test benches before, nor we can open source them here. The reason is that a lot of commercial tools are used to produce verification test benches. But in working with partners and customers, we can obviously share that. And this includes uh, our verification environment, which is UVM based. Uh, multiple test benches for every microarchitectural piece in the core, plus the uh, uh, random stress uh, generator for the core that does the, you know, they cycles through billions of random instructions, all with interrupts and everything, compares with golden models. So. It's only for partners? Uh, it would be only for partners, yes. Okay, in the interest or of customers. Time. In the interest of time, let's give Zonomir one last clap. Thank you very much. Great questions, folks. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much.